But now on BBC Radio 4, in living memory, Chris Ledgard revisits one 70s summer when a tall tale of terror kept us out of the water. I'm in North Cornwall, in the town of Bude, standing in the main street on a cold, wintry day, grey skies, shark grey skies, if you like. And um, I'm heading to a bookshop, the Spencer Thorne bookshop. And... Uh, you don't have to be in here long before you see that there's a bit of a shark theme going on. There's a carousel of books here with Cornish history, Cornwall's history, fish recipes from the southwest. But quickly you get to Shark Attack Britain, Sharks off Cornwall and Devon, Sharks in British Seas, and uh, here in the fiction section, in the bees, looking for Peter Benchley. Here he is, Peter Benchley's Jaws. I touched a fear that was as old as mankind. When anybody goes swimming in water over their head, they're afraid of something, but they don't know quite what it is. Here, for the first time, it was portrayed for them, and they could use their imagination to think of what a 25-foot-long great white shark would be like. This is an original first edition hardback copy of the book when it first came out, and I think this black edition, in my opinion, is certainly a lot more menacing than the one that is used, certainly for the film poster. This is my pride and joy, the fact that it's not only a first edition, but it's actually also signed by Peter Benchley. He actually did a drawing of a shark as well. Quite a prized possession in my collection. Bookshop owner Chris Pringle is now a trustee of the conservation charity The Shark Trust. His fascination with the animal began with the film, released in 1975 by Universal Pictures. Together with Peter Benchley's book, published a year earlier, Jaws was a mass media event, a perfect storm that marked a change in direction for both the film industry and the shark. A hundred yards offshore, the fish sensed a change in the sea's rhythm. It did not see the woman, nor yet did it smell her. Running within the length of its body were a series of thin canals filled with mucus and dotted with nerve endings. And these nerves detected vibrations and signaled to the brain. The fish turned towards shore. I did sneak in to see it a year younger than I should have done. It came out in 1975. I was only 11 at the time. But my best friend and I uh, were very, very keen to see it. He wanted to see it from the sheer fear element. I wanted to see it because of the subject matter. So I, aged 11, you were already interested in sharks? Already interested. I remember being down on Brighton Beach and seeing people catch uh, taupe and seeing these things just in buckets and just thinking, you know, these are magnificent creatures. They should actually be out there in the sea. And obviously something triggered at that point. And then hearing of this film come along, I thought, age can't be a restriction on it. I've got to go and see it. Mm. I sneaked in and my, uh, my friend hid during all the scary scenes. I was just there in awe of this creature. My immediate reaction on coming out of the cinema was trying to convince my friend Michael, let's go and see it again now, there's another performance in an hour. <laughs> he was so scared, he just wanted to go home. Yeah. But I think I came away from it wanting to know more. That probably set me on my track for my almost sort of shark obsession. Guys, we can't shoot right now, hold on. Film critic Ian Johnston reported from the set of Jaws for the BBC's Film 74 programme, and he found the crew struggling with their watery location, Martha's Vineyard, on the east coast of America. The film stars Roy Scheider of The French Connection and Richard Dreyfus of American Graffiti. The director said he faced that in the studio and he said, I can't do it in time. To shoot for 13 weeks at a budget of over a million pounds is something of a rarity these days. So the producers, Richard Zanuck and David Brown, must have a lot of faith in their property, and even more in their director, Mr Spielberg, who is only 26 years old. I know, because he'll be, he'll be so energetic. He'll be screaming and yelling, it's a great way, it's a great way, I knew it all along. If I look at my um, childhood diary... With a little sketch here, of, of a very good sketch of Jaws. Yeah, then, and underneath it says, tonight, Dad took Simon, which is my brother, me, and Angus, who's my friend... Richard Angerson, to see Jaws, had chips. The fact that we had chips afterwards is almost as important on the page yeah. as the fact that we saw Jaws, but I know for a fact that Jaws blew my mind because it absolutely did, as it did everybody who saw it at the time. Jaws aficionado Andrew Collins is film editor at the Radio Times. On the Sunday, that was on the Friday, on the Sunday, 
it says that I built the orca, which is the boat they go out to sea and to catch the shark, out of Lego, which is pretty good going. It's very difficult to, to make a boat out of Lego. And then I took some soldiers, World War II soldiers, and sort of sawed bits off them and repainted them so they looked like Richard Dreyfus and <laughs> Sheriff Brody <laughs> and put them in the boat. And I already had a, a, a very good great white shark, which I'd bought on holiday, a plastic one, uh, in Wales the year before at the height of my pre-Jaws Jaws obsession and that actually was perfectly to scale to the boat that I made right. it looked huge next to this boat that I made so yeah, I, and I used to just play Jaws 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 is the game where you try to fish out what's in the jaws of the shark I remember actually doing a version of Quint Robert Shaw's character sawn in half, I went down to the garage and got my dad's hacksaw and sawed it in half and then put blood on the top half so that I could play out the bit where he gets bitten in half The Jaws will get you Hollywood was in uh, quite a parlous state at the end of the 60s. I mean, it had its golden age, and most people mark the end of its golden age, or the beginning from the talkies to the end, roughly in the 60s, when TV had proliferated everywhere, and people were staying in and watching stuff at home and not going out to the cinema. Cinema was competing with TV, and, and it did this, certainly in the 60s, by spending more money on big spectaculars, like Doctor Doolittle, which was a huge flop. Uh, and so by the end of the 60s, the, the old system was not working. And so what happened was partly because the first generation of people who'd gone to film school were starting to turn up. Young guns, like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, these people who were students of film and wanted to make films. Um, they came through at exactly the right time because Hollywood was looking for a new way of doing things. But it's a studio picture, but they'd obviously risked a lot by allowing this young guy to take the helm of this thing, which was based, after all, on a best-selling book and was going to be a big adventure movie. But The Godfather had come out earlier in the 70s. Francis Coppola was also an untried young film student, and he'd made this one of the... It was one of the biggest box office successes he'd had and won Oscars. And so the studios realised not only could these films win them awards with these new guys at the helm, but they could also make a lot of money. And The Godfather had made a lot of money, but no one saw it coming. And they released it in the way that all big films got released in those days, which was to release it in a couple of major cities, get some reviews and some early buzz and then release it wider across the country and the idea with Jaws because it was the summer and this had not been done before they released it across hundreds of cinemas at the same time not as many as uh, as they originally wanted they wanted to do it over 900 cinemas apparently this is unheard of uh, and the studio were reluctant to do that but they still released it in hundreds of cinemas on the same day and so the idea of people queuing around the block for this film that used to be something that could only really occur in the big cities, but this happening everywhere. Mm. So it became the first summer blockbuster. And because there was a lot of marketing, an awful lot of marketing, there was things like beach towels and mugs, that kind of stuff. And everybody, hey, you had to go and see it. Mm. You know, this thing was advertised everywhere, the book was everywhere. If you didn't go and see it, you wouldn't be able to join in the national conversation. So and that was, it was very shrewd and very clever. The product, though, was good. And if the film hadn't delivered then this would have been a huge backfire, but it really did deliver. And so they were able to... I think they had it in about 1,000 cinemas by the end at the same time across America, which is massive. Roll sound. It's taken pretty well all day to get this shot. Time and tide still refuse to obey the director. One of the actors has to climb from the rescue craft into the half-sunk boat. An easy enough task, you might think. How much do you subscribe to the idea that the product being as good as you say it was was to a degree an accident because the mechanical shark or sharks, I think there were four of them, sharks, mm. didn't work in the water. So, And there was no CGI back then, no computer-generated imagery. So necessity being the mother of invention and all that, Spielberg had to sort of turn to his own imagination to work out how to create the effect he wanted. But that all, that all seems based on the accident of the fact the shark didn't work. Yeah, you, obviously you can't legislate for that, but that's definitely true. And if you, uh, if you rewrite history on one thing not happening, if that shark had worked, Jaws wouldn't have been as good, might not have been so successful, Summer Blockbuster might not have been invented, Star Wars might not have come out... Um, Luckily, it didn't work, and so they had to use, he had to use his imagination, and, and, and it was not seeing the shark that makes it so brilliant. The opening stuff where you're under the water, you are the shark. I mean, that was so clever, because obviously you can't see the shark, you are it, and then it takes its first victim. And when you do see the shark, you're so involved in the film that the deficiency of mm -hmm. that model shark, you let it off. Maybe too intense for younger children. 
Here at the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth, some very young children are pressing their noses up against the vast glass wall of the tank as the sharks glide serenely by. I'm here to meet the aquarium's managing director, David Gibson, and to get a little closer to some of the live attractions. We're in the access area above the, the ocean tank because it's feeding time for the sun right. tiger sharks. Sun tiger sharks are the biggest species we have here, about three metres in length, about 160, 170 kilograms in weight, and uh, quite, quite fearsome looking animals. So you've got the people here with long metal poles with fish speared on the end, Yes. and the sharks grab the, they, the fish off the end. It's the safest way for the sand tigers, and it's the safest way for my staff as well. It's the last thing you want to do, really, is, is be putting your hands directly in front of a three-metre-long predator. Are they interested in your hand, or it would just get caught up in the, no, they're just the general not, melee? No, they, they can get overly excited when they're feeding, and they have the capability of taking a limb off, so it's, you, don't want to, you don't want to risk it, really. So what kind of sharks do we get, both in terms of the, the regular ones that you're likely to see and the, yes. and the strays, the very occasional visitor that's, that's a rarity? Well, around about the UK, there are, I think... The last time I looked, there's about 26 different species of shark. So we have poor beagle, we have mako, we have short fin mako, large eyed mako, uh, we have thresher, we have blue shark, we have um, basking shark, this, which is the second yeah. largest fish in the world. Now, unfortunately, the numbers, the actual physical numbers, is nowhere near what they used to be. The world over, shark populations have been reduced by anything up to 95% in the last 15 to 20 years. Pure because of hunting? Because of the demand for shark fin, so it's uh, and the UK population is exactly the same. We've we've lost between eighty and ninety percent of our sharks. But they're not hunted here, though, are they? They they have been, yes. Yeah. Very recently, we we managed to achieve protection for sharks uh, from finning within UK waters and European waters. And you've got lots of other fish in here too, including some quite small ones. Why don't the sharks eat the fish that are in the in the tank? They are inherently lazy, uh, <laughs> essentially. The, no, there's, there's one there. That's oh. a fish fan. They're in no hurry, are they? They, they just very, very relaxed. glide slowly very up relaxed. the pole. And, that, and, and that's part of the, the answer to the, the previous question, really. They conserve energy. Like all animals, they, their energy budget is crucial to them. So if they can have fish presented to them, you can see... Just the, the, the classic the there, classic the fin, fin breaking coming the out of the water there. with the sunlight shining through the little window on it. That's yeah. a beautiful picture. So they, they, they're inherently lazy, they'll conserve their energy budget. If they're being provided by fish directly in front of them, yeah. then that's what they'll take. There we are, they've got a perfect view. Not in any hurry at all, fish yeah. goes in, in Simple. one, gone. Now that's wow. extremely deceptive. Oh, and it's, it's a three metre long animal. You've got 60 centimetres at the front end, which is jaw and teeth, yeah. and the rest of it is solid muscle. So when they... Sorry, we've been, we've been deafened by a, a southern stingray, right. getting excited about its food there. <laughs> But um, you know, you've got two and a half metres of muscle behind the jaws, yeah. and that muscle can create an enormous burst of speed. Yeah. And the question, I suppose, that's been asked a million times in this aquarium is, um, are they man-eaters? Are they interested no. in human flesh? No. The sand tigers that we keep are kept for a reason. They're globally threatened now. They're only found in three locations worldwide. Unfortunately, in the 70s and early 80s, the, the wild populations were, were devastated by shark hunting. How much do you think... Jaws led to an explosion in that kind of hunting, that there was much more of a sense of free fall because the shark was even more than ever the enemy. Unfortunately, uh, as much as I admire Peter Benchley, I think that I think the book and then the film mm. almost gave carte blanche to hunt sharks. And you met Peter Benchley? I was lucky enough to meet Peter about ten months or so before he actually passed away. He came to an aquarium called The Deep that I, mm. I ran at the time and gave a lecture on shark conservation and the work that he'd done since the, the film was released. And he was extremely humble. Uh, we had a very good personal chat about uh, his experiences after writing the book and the release of the film. And he deeply regretted doing it. You got that, did you? You got I, a real he, sense of he, regret. He told me that he wished he'd never written the book because of the impact it had had on, on great white sharks in particular. But the, the work that he personally did and the, and the money he provided for shark conservation and research has made a huge difference to our understanding of the species. The snout passed first, then the jaw, slack and smiling, armed with row upon row of serrate triangles. And then the black, fathomless eye, seemingly riveted upon him. The gills rippled, bloodless wounds in the steely skin. 
Tentatively, Hooper stuck a hand through the bars and touched the flank. It felt cold and hard, not, not clammy, but smooth as vinyl. He let his fingertips caress the flesh, past the pectoral fins, the pelvic fin, the thick, firm genital claspers, until finally, the fish seemed to have no end. They were slapped away by the sweeping tail. I was probably about um, 16 or 17 when it first came out, and my memory for films normally is terrible, but I remember Jaws, I haven't seen it since, I remember it in amazing detail. It had a big impact on me, because for all my life up until then, I'd wanted to be a biologist or particularly a marine biologist and I remember this is very sad going out uh, straight after seeing the film and buying a jeans jacket like Matt Hooper the marine biologist was wearing in the in the movie because it had it's, I just wanted to be like him that's what I wanted to do. If Jaws inspired and terrorized in equal measure it wasn't the first time the shark had been cast as villain. Zoologist and conservationist Mark Carwardine. To be fair to Peter Benchley and Jaws, um, although it had a massive impact on our view of sharks, people were talking about shark attacks and they were big news long before that. I mean, you know, there are records of Greek historians 2,500 years ago talking about shark attacks. Um, the Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder, he was writing about shark attacks and that was 2,000 years ago. Um, and then during the Second World War, of course, there were a number of uh, ships were torpedoed and sailors were killed by sharks and they made headline news. But I do think Jaws was the real turning point in the Western world, in the way we see sharks. I mean, scientifically, it makes sense for us to be nervous of predators, but to get it so out of proportion is, I think, because of that link that Jaws made tourists in the water and sharks. I mean, when you think about it logically, though, there are very few shark attacks around the world. We're talking in an average year between 70 and 100 shark attacks. And of those attacks, most will be little bites, just good stories to tell afterwards, not serious. Maybe five to 15 people get killed by sharks every year. But think of how many millions and millions of people are in the sea every day all over the world, diving, surfing, snorkeling, swimming, paddling. And there are sharks having encounters with a lot of those people every day. And it didn't just demonise sharks, it demonised one particular species of shark, it was the great white shark. Yes. I is that fair? No. I mean, great white sharks are potentially dangerous. I've snorkeled with them quite a few times, never had any problem. But sharks kill people and sharks attack people and they're very dangerous animals. No, I would disagree with that. I don't think they are very dangerous animals. They're, they're potentially dangerous, some sharks. You could fly up the coast of Florida, which is, a, which is one of the major shark attack hotspots of the world, and there'll be hundreds of thousands of people in the water, and you'll see sharks with them mingling. They don't know they're there. There are sharks there all the time. Very occasionally, and this is very rare, a shark will attack somebody and eat the person. Um, but in most cases, it's a case of mis either testing, and what sharks do is they'll bump you, and people count that as an attack, or they'll just take a little bite out of you. And if it's a great white, of course, that's serious. But they'll take a bite, realise that you're not prey, and then they'll move on. There are all sorts of amazing statistics, hilarious statistics, that put it into perspective. I mean, more people in America, get, and America's generally a hot spot for shark attacks, get killed by falling into holes in the sand they've dug themselves on the beach than by sharks. And for every person who gets bitten by a shark, 25 people get bitten by New Yorkers. It's just because it's a horrible thing to happen and it would be a very frightening thing to be attacked by a shark. It's just bigger in our heads than it should be. I love that idea that you can fly over the water and see sharks underneath people that they can't see. Just well, I remember one particular occasion in South Africa. I was doing a, a, an aerial survey of whales. Yeah. We were flying along the coast uh, at the, behind all the waves breaking yeah. and there were a whole bunch of surfers sitting on their surfboards, probably about 15 surfers. And we, as we flew over, we saw two great whites swimming up to them. We couldn't signal to them or say anything. We just circled and watched. And the great whites, they were all sitting with their feet dangling in the water. The great whites swam from one surfer to the next, checked yeah. them all out, and then carried on. And the surfers, because of the reflection of the sun or something, they had no idea. They didn't seem to react. They didn't know they'd been checked out by two great whites. And, you know, that happens all the time. And that really does say that they're not out to get us. We're not their natural prey. I mean, they really are extraordinary creatures. They're fundamental to ecosystems. They're built like Starship Enterprise. They've got so many different senses we can't even imagine. Mm. And they could be useful to us as well. I mean, there are all sorts of 
incredible scientific studies at the moment. Sharks, for example, don't seem to suffer from cancer. And so there's a big possibility we might better learn something that would be beneficial to us. And, um, you know, aeroplane manufacturers are studying shark skin because it's fantastic to cut down on turbulence. So they're, they're, they're amazing creatures in their own right, and we should be protecting them. But getting people to get excited about it and wanting more sharks in the seas is very difficult. When you're a seven-year-old child, you know, it is the dolphins and the sharks and the whales that you pick up on in, in kids' books and on television, and that's where it really captures your imagination. And that persists right through to students becoming qualified marine biologists. In the long run, it may be that all publicity does turn out to be good publicity. Even if we remain scared of sharks, we're at least not guilty of ignoring them. Matt Bentley is Professor of Marine Biology at Newcastle University, and director of the Dove Marine Laboratory on the Northumberland coast. If you think about when the film was made, um, what it did probably was instill fear in people of the sharks. But most people in the, in the late 1970s uh, had relatively little exposure to sharks. There were relatively few surfers, relatively few people scuba diving and snorkelling. Travel wasn't as freely available as it was now. So that fear kind of persisted, I think, for a few years. But then gradually um, people became more aware of uh, of actually how we should respect sharks as an animal and how in fact they are seriously endangered, many species are endangered, over-exploitation through uh, the fin trade, which is, takes a huge toll of, of sharks. Essentially sharks are, are caught and the fins are, are simply sliced off them and the carcasses while still alive are thrown back into the sea. They are uh, top predators, so not as numerous as you might imagine. So this removes a lot of, of breeding individuals from the population and can put the populations at risk. They're kept in the public eye by you know, infrequent but, but significant shark attacks which have occurred recently in the Indian Ocean, some off the coast of America, particularly off Western Australia. Time of day is, is important. Uh, these predators might tend to be more active. Um, they're what's called crepuscular by nature, which means more active around the times of dawn and dusk. So when light levels are low, it's probably not a good time to be in the water. Uh, bull sharks, for example, are sharks that can move into estuaries and fresh waters, into marinas. Um, I know we saw the great white in a, in a situation like that in the film, but bull sharks certainly um, occur in those sorts of environments. And then you've got the added complication of, of, of shark tourism. So uh, you, you have, particularly around South Africa, for example, people who will go cage diving with sharks, viewing great white sharks, and of course they're, they're chumming, they're putting material into the sea which attracts the sharks, which gets the sharks into a, a frenzy, for want of a better word, but, but so that, that tourists can get their photo shots and these kind of things. So there is that topping up of the fear element um, which keeps sharks in the public eye, and that probably does more good than harm because it fuels interest, it provides perhaps funding for conservation activities, it focuses the attention on the awful um, shark fin trade and so on. So I think the benefits that have derived from the film uh, outweigh the, the, the negatives. In 1975, a shark was as exotic and alien as a Californian surfer, a glamorous creature from the other side of the world, a million miles from the kiss-me-quick banality of the British seaside. But if Jaws kept us out of the water, one man living in North Cornwall wants us to get back into the Atlantic and face-to-face -face with some domestic sharks. Richard Pearce is director of the Shark Trust. I look out of my window and... Um, Nowadays, I see an awful lot of surfers out there the year round. They're sharing the water with an animal called a poor beagle shark, which is a first cousin of the great white shark. And I've done a lot of work with poor beagles, literally just beyond the surf line, where I can see just out of my window. There's never been an incident that I'm aware of yet uh, in any way seriously threatening a human. And poor beagles are not sort of poor relations of great whites. The largest poor beagle caught in Britain was a 35-stone animal. So these are big sharks. Never any record of them molesting humans. What's the closest we've come in the UK to a confirmed great white sighting? Is there any chance it would be this far north? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I remain convinced that we do get occasional white sharks visiting our shores. Great white and, sharks? Great, great white sharks, I'm sorry, yes. Um, and I've, I've looked at... Approaching 100 incidents, I think it's 89 or 91 or something, uh, of, conf uh, of great, you know, theoretical and uh, great white shark encounters. Only, 
I think it's eight remain credible following investigation. Now, I can't say that that eight involved a great white shark because I wasn't there. I didn't see them. There's no proof. There's no photograph. I just can say that, that they remain credible in terms of uh, the, the description as, as told to me. The closest white shark, a great white shark, um, to Britain is the northern bear Biscay, an animal caught in the late 70s, if my memory serves. Uh, this was a female. That's only um, 198 nautical miles or something from Cornwall. I mean, that's a walk in the park for these guys. You know, they're long-range animals. They can go an awful lot farther than that. So I'm absolutely sure we probably get the occasional vagrant visitor. And some of these stories that have been reported to me probably did involve great white sharks. And no one was attacked because they don't regard humans as a food source. We need to be very clear about that. We're not on their menu. Sadly, they are on our menu. In Cornwall, what's the situation at the moment? Are Cornish skippers who are running fishing trips for tourists listening to the conservation message, do you think, or not? I think we need to f separate fishing and angling. Shark angling arguably can be of benefit to sharks in the sense that sharks are no longer killed by shark angling skippers. They're caught and then the hook is taken out and they're released. Mm. So that's giving sharks alive as opposed to a dead value. I started cage diving with blue sharks off Cornwall in about seven years ago now, not because I wanted to make a commercial thing out of it myself, but because I, I hoped that, that skippers would take it up and turn it into uh, something that would work commercially and be of assistance to them and spread the public awareness message and, and obviously bring some money into the county. The only thing that has stopped blue sharks becoming a major ecotourism thing in Cornwall, like Great Whites in South Africa, is the British weather. There just are not enough reliable days to get out there uh, on the water and, uh, and do it. And you have to go 12, 14, 15 miles out. The fish smelled her now, and the vibrations, erratic and sharp, signalled distress. The fish began to circle close to the surface. Its dorsal fin broke water, and its tail, thrashing back and forth, cut the glassy surface with a hiss. A series of tremors shook its body. It sends a sort of a different shiver up human spines than any other word. I mean, if you say lion or tiger or something, it doesn't have the same effect. We do have this special view of sharks, and I actually think that we want them to be monsters. I think no matter what I say about the fact that they're not as dangerous as people think, about the chance of shark attack being very small and so on and so forth, Humans want their monsters, and sadly, since time began, sharks have been cast as monsters. In Living Memory was presented by Chris Ledgeart and produced in Bristol by John Byrne. But first, the shark biologist Gareth Fraser takes a personal journey into Peter Benchley's 1974 thriller Jaws in Don't Go Into the Water. The great fish moved silently through the night water, propelled by short sweeps of its crescent tail. The eyes were sightless in the black, and the other senses transmitted nothing extraordinary to the small, primitive brain. The fish might have been asleep, save for the movement dictated by countless millions of years of instinctive continuity. Forty years ago, a book was published, Jaws, a story of a large rogue shark that devastates a seaside resort. It survived only by moving. <laughs> God, well, the fish might have been asleep, save for the movement. I'd forgotten this stuff. Peter Benchley's 1974 novel spawned the first summer blockbuster. And while he was in London a few days ago, Rosemary Hart met him and asked him what it was about sharks that first got him, well, hooked. What fascinated me years ago when I first started studying them was the very primitive nature of the animal. They're, they're basically unchanged for 30 million years. They have not had to evolve. And being primitive, perfect. And in the perfection also to have the in inherent menace of the fact that living in an environment in which man chooses to trespass, they eat people now and again. And the story still preys on our fears. Killer Great White Shark Lydia is heading to a beach near... A killer Great White Shark was last night heading for the British coast. Keep out of its way. 
In the UK, we're bombarded with fantasies of great white sharks terrorising our shores. Why does Jaws hit a nerve in us? It even captivates us scientists. David Sims is Professor of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of Southampton. I mean, I always like the first line, move silently through the water with short sweeps of its crescent tail. Mm. That's quite accurate. What about the primitive brain? Yeah, the small primitive... I mean, the word primitive is always a problem. It's primitive in the sense that it's old. Mm -hmm. It's perhaps an ancestral type sort of lower vertebrate brain. But, of course, it's highly sophisticated. Yeah. You know. I think they probably use this, this primitive idea for fictional gain. You know, this ancient beast of the deep that's survived everything and now it's going to come and eat you. You can't defeat it. Mm -hmm. It's done everything. It's seen everything for millions of years. You are but a blip. I'm a shark biologist and I'm surrounded by shark jaws. Their teeth are unique. They regenerate continuously through life. In my lab at the University of Sheffield, we study how sharks can produce so many teeth. We hope to use this information to help humans regrow missing teeth. Let's try and get out of the wind. Let's, let's go in here. Great, that's better. I grew up in Ogmore by Sea in South Wales. I have early memories of fishing with my father, Tony. He would take us to the expanse of dark water, set up his rods, tell stories and sing songs of the deep ocean and beasts that lived beneath the waves. It would always be a heart-thumping lottery to see what odd fishes he caught. I was already drawn to the ocean when my dad slipped Spielberg's blockbuster Jaws into our new video machine. I was seven. The first time you saw it, you were terrified. You couldn't watch it. But after you'd watched it about six times, as you did, I remember you pointing out the Richard Dreyfuss character, the, the shark expert. I remember you saying, Dad, that's where I want to be when I grow up. I used to wind you up by saying there's sharks at Altmore by Sea and they used to look for them in rock pools. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember seeing the uh, Dreyfus character, Hooper, turn up and say, you know, I'm from the Oceanographic Institute, right. you know, I study yeah. sharks. I thought, is that really a career? Yeah. You can do that? I was in awe of Matt Hooper, the shark biologist. That struck me in the film as well. Seven years old, seeing someone who did that for a job. I mean, the thing that struck me about Matt Hooper was his dissection of the tiger shark <laughs> right. and the stomach, and uh, he, he flips out a fish and then a tin can and then a number plate <laughs> from Louisiana. Yeah. Oh, it's travelled up from the south. <laughs> Brilliant bit of scientific detective work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's probably quite accurate, though, isn't yeah. it? No need for satellite tags <laughs> <laughs> when you have a number plate in the stomach. <laughs> What do you ask how much uh, the boat was uh, that <laughs> Dreyfus character had? They said, right, well, they'd probably go to a dinghy, Gareth, but apart from that, you can't eat me. But that's who you wanted to be. Yeah. Where is my character? Although Dad is a night fisherman, he's scared of the water. It's a lot safer <laughs> occupations than swimming with sharks, Gareth. Well, know. I remember you used to take us fishing. You used to tell us you know, horror stories about the things you were pulling up from the, from the deep, you know? Yeah. These poisonous things. You don't yeah. want to go in anywhere near these. Don't yeah, touch them. The more these. scary, the more fascinated you were with them. <laughs> Just that particular film, Jaws, had a huge influence on you. What's really interesting is that there's a definite divide. There's generations of kids that yeah. were inspired by the movie and also generations of kids that were terrified. You know, terrified. And it really instilled a huge fear in them, actually. Now? In 1976, the summer after the film was released, families would cancel their beach holidays, even in safe waters around the UK. Vicky Brown is scared to go in the North Sea. It's only a few notes, it's, but it's genius really because it's, it's just the build-up of it. It starts and you think something is watching me and then as it builds up it just makes me panic. It makes me feel like I need to get out. Even though I'm not in the water I just think I, I need to get somewhere safe. As soon as I get in the water now I do, I hear those few notes and it just makes me think, oh. I studied film at university so I, I love the film in a way but also hate the fear that it's put into me. It has stopped me from enjoying the sea like I see a lot of other people do, swimming in the sea, even lakes, and even in swimming pools in the dark. I know that's kind of irrational, but I get flashbacks from the film and I think, oh, I don't want to go in. 
So, Connie, I, I think you have a completely irrational fear of any body of water, <laughs> no matter what it is, whether it's a sea or a lake. The bathtub. Maybe the bathtub. <laughs> Even my wife, Connie, is scarred from watching Jaws. But, you know, I'm not scared of the things that could actually legitimately happen to me, like drowning or, right. you know, undertow or getting sucked out to sea or anything like that. I'm afraid of getting my leg bitten off. Um, <laughs> but I, I know that it's completely irrational. I understand this fear. I'm not fearless. I just did something very different with my fear. I confronted it. This terror of monsters of the deep. It's irrational, right? Emma Citron is a psychologist who runs a fear clinic. I think all fears and phobias affect about 5% of us, and generally they relate to something that we have an innate fear of that perhaps evolutionarily we inherited for, from our ancestors. It's called pre-technological man fears. They're such things as spiders and snakes. And also we have two fears of falling and of, I think, the dark and right, the unknown. Okay. I think those are sort of innate fears, yeah, if you yeah, like. Okay. So you're basically saying that... There isn't such a thing necessarily as an irrational fear if we have these innate fears of the unknown. They are very rational. Right. I think that's the point. What we see in Jaws is the fear of the unknown. We all know that there's lots going on under the water. So I think this is tapping in to something in all of us. It's not just for the mad. I always just think I can't see my feet and there's, there's something under there. You don't know what's beneath you and the, the sea's so big and you're so tiny. Jaws gripped our innate fears of the unknown and showed us there was something real to be scared of down there. A true monster. A shark. At the beginning, you know, when the girl is swimming at midnight and, you know, she feels so safe because nothing's ever happened. I don't want to be that person <laughs> where nothing's ever oh, happened right. until it happens <laughs> to me. <laughs> the film starts underwater, showing very little and with the sinister soundtrack by John Williams. So I think this intro is really great when you, you're the shark. Well, that's what's allowing you to believe, right? Now we're on a beach for a moonlit barbecue. First to swim, said the woman, to clear your head. Forget my head, said the man. Giggling, he fell backward onto the sand, pulling the woman down with him. Afterward, the man laid back and closed his eyes. The woman looked at him and smiled. Now how about that swim, she said. Swimming! It's already this first scene. I think the great thing about this is that it's dark, right? And I wonder if, I mean, I think a lot of people have fears about swimming in the dark at night. And I think it's the very normalness of it which also sets the scene of fear. Susan Backlany plays the shark's first victim in the film. A hundred yards offshore, the fish sense a change in the sea's rhythm. And the fish recognise prey. The great thing about the scene is you don't see anything. All you're seeing is the girl being tossed around, completely terrified. <laughs> And then it's silent. When Jaws came out in 1975, the British Board of Film Censors classified the film as A, which meant children of any age could see it. Okay, so this is a, uh, a letter from a member of the public to the British Film Censors. Dear Sirs, I'm a 20-year-old marine biology student. Having seen the film Jaws, I wish to complain about it being given an A certificate. The sight of humans being eaten by the shark, not to mention the mangled remains, really upset me. Wow. The invisible danger lurking beneath the water isn't what these people worried about, but the gory bits. It is the most terrifying gruesome, gory, dramatic film and surely totally unsuitable for anyone under 16, if not 18. A gnawed off leg, a head floating, a very good film, but gory. 
Okay. The scene which troubles the censors most is where Quint, a bounty hunter played by Robert Shaw, is eaten alive by the Great White. Okay, so another letter. The final scene of Robert Shaw being eaten alive sticks in the mind. I feel a child would be really upset by it. Oh my goodness. The British Board of Film Censors replied, The one danger which was pointed out to us concerned the very common infantile fantasies of being eaten, as in Hansel and Gretel, which some maladjusted children carry with them into their primary school years. And for this reason, it was felt to be important to attach a warning to the film that certain sequences might, this is in quotations, might be particularly disturbing to younger and unaccompanied children. And this has been included in all advertising as well as in cinema foyers. On the other hand, it was also felt that the number of children vulnerable to a serious extent were insufficient to justify barring the film to the more robust and well-adjusted majority. <laughs> wow. Jaws was the first film to be issued with a warning advising parents to protect vulnerable young kids from seeing it alone. I wouldn't have let my 12-year-old see that film. I certainly wouldn't have put it on at a birthday party. Right. So, so what age do you think children should be allowed to watch Jaws? If I was setting the certification, I'd put it at 14. It's so hard to predict how a child will react. Around the same time I was inspired by Jaws, I was petrified by a film called Rats. I would probably show Jaws to my young kids. Connie might kill me for saying this, but it's an education. If I hadn't seen Jaws at a young age, by 14 I may have missed out on the inspiration. Soon after my introduction to Jaws, I left Ogmore and the sea for the city. But I always felt pulled to the ocean, a tug that connected me to the place where I'd felt most at home. Well, I wish I was a bosun bold or a sailor without fear. I'd build a boat and away I'd float and for me true love steer. For me true love steer me boys with the dancing dolphins play. And the whales and sharks are having their larks ten thousand miles away. My dad still lives and sings in Old One by Sea. Whereas well, my character on Jaws, I'd have been Quint. Yeah, well, I see that now. Yeah. When he uh, launched into that song, the part where Richard Dreyfus was putting the cage on the ship, mm -hmm. and he said, what's that? He said, it's a shark cage. He says, so, so the cage goes in the water, you're in the cage, in the water, the shark's in the water. Farewell and adieu to your first Spanish ladies. <laughs> I think that's an interesting dynamic. The fisherman, the common fisherman, knows the sea, yeah. has worked on the ocean for 40 years, and then the scientist that thinks he knows it better. Just so you know, you know, there's a Quinn character, <laughs> the Richard Dreyfus character. <laughs> that's right. You know, yeah. And maybe we can argue about different things, you know, mm -hmm. because I know you like all the scientific names, but I know the names that local anglers use right. for different species. Yeah, yeah. You know where they are, you know where to fish. The tides, weather conditions, mm -hmm. reading the sea is a science. Yeah, of course. So you've got to keep an eye on it. Dangerous. Because people think, you know, you just, you just come down, set up a fishing rod and go fishing. Mm -hmm. You've got to have that knowledge. Especially right. fishing at, you know, at night, as we do. Mm -hmm. Because you can't see the waves coming in. You can hear them. and feel them. You can smell them. And at the last minute, uh, the tilly lamp just picks up the crest of the wave. I know you'd like to live back by the sea, wouldn't you? I'd love it. I think that's one of your regrets, was moving away from the sea, wasn't it? Of course. Yeah, when I was young, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> I'm at home in the ocean. I've swum with sharks, constantly watching in awe their graceful movements, looking out for the telltale signs of agitation, which never come. Sharks aren't what Jaws made them out to be. Swordfish. I'm fascinated by how sharks look. Swordfish and how scary they actually look, but they're actually quite friendly. <laughs> so is, it, is, is this one of your favourite things to see at the aquarium? Yeah. Yeah? So would you swim with a shark? Yeah. yeah. You would? You know, are you not scared that they might eat you? No. So, so have you seen uh, Jaws? Yes, I have, yeah. yeah. So, so would you show the movie to your son? No. No. <laughs> it was against sharks, wasn't it? 
It was a great white and it was killing people. Children who come to Aquaria learn a different view of sharks to the monster in Peter Benchley's jaws. Well, this way at least he knows that they're safe and harmless, most of them, most of the time. And they're beautiful. And graceful, aren't they? He just loves them. Where's the shark, Callum? There. The deep in Hull is run by Colin Brown. So Colin, could you recall the first time you saw the film Jaws? I certainly can because I saw it on the day it came out in in Leicester Square. A couple of friends and I queued up to go and see it. No, no, huge queues. Apparently it was just a huge event that people couldn't wait to see. That time, of course, I worked in swimming pools, so it was more interesting uh, stopping things from being alive in the water rather than keeping them alive. Although having your father run an aquarium doesn't guarantee you immunity from Jaws. I know my daughters saw it uh, when they were young, probably too young to be fair, and refused to go into the sea for years afterwards. One of them now still really won't go in the water. My dad and my sister think that if you're scared of something you should research it more, and the more you find out the less afraid you'll be, but it doesn't seem to work like that for me. I guess one question you'll probably have a lot from from members of the public is why don't the sharks eat all the other fish in the tank? Yeah, and and the answer is that they're well fed by us. The only time that that they did actually take some of the fish was when there was a power cut and we have emergency lighting, and the emergency lighting also failed, which meant that the tank went into complete darkness and then something clicked in with their uh, senses and they did take a few then. But for the last 12 years, I think we can count the number of fish we've lost to the sharks on the fingers of one hand. Scares me is the teeth because it's they're just like sharks. They're so sharp, yeah, yeah. And they're able to replace their teeth in a conveyor belt, which is probably why they're top predators, right? So they've always got teeth. Sharks are predators, exquisite examples of evolutionary success. And yes, they feed in the ocean. But they're not these soulless, vengeful killing machines portrayed in Jaws. So how do you think Jaws impacted the public opinion of sharks? Jaws had a significant impact, and, and I know Peter Benchley thought the same thing. He came here about six months before he died to help us raise money for shark conservation. So I think he was aware of the uh, damage it did to the image of the shark. It's almost exclusively as killing machines, almost sort of hateful mm-hmm. animals. Jaws's portrayal of the shark led to a seek-and-destroy frenzy that endangered the great white. It justified a kind of killing spree by hunters, something Benchley deeply regretted. Even now, close to one million sharks are slaughtered unnecessarily each year. David Sims is Deputy Director of Research at the Marine Biological Association in Plymouth. Do you remember the first time you saw Jaws? I can, of course. I was seven years old. I think the scariest moment for me was when the head popped out of the hole in the hull. You know, it was simply because that took you by surprise. Um, the concept's very simple. There's a very large shark. It is going to consume some humans at some point. But a huge number of humans, actually. So even then, when I was seven, I was thinking, that's a lot. I think there were six human beings were consumed. the average number of people that get taken by sharks globally, right? Yeah, and by one shark. I mean, we did a study recently trying to estimate the metabolic rate of a great white shark. So a five-metre great white, if it did take half a human, it would probably last it about two to three weeks. Wow. Yeah. So the movie's completely bogus. Yeah, I mean, if you were going in there as a seven-year-old, you knew a lot about bioenergetics. (laughs) Yes, it was bogus, for sure, yeah. But it's a great movie, though. Yeah, Spielberg made a great movie. (laughs) Yeah. So David, do you want to tell us where we are right now? Yes, we're at the Marine Biological Association Laboratory in Plymouth and we're sitting in the seawater aquarium and it's here that we do some of our research on sharks and rays. The question is, you know, are sharks and rays predictable? How do they learn? In fact, they learn very quickly and they can remember things for long periods of time. So you say that sharks are learning, they have a memory, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so in Jaws, that one shark has a vendetta against the family. So I think it comes back in the sequel too, to to attack the rest of the family. So it knows who it's going for. Is that possible, do you think? I would ask, how would it do that? (laughs) (laughs) We certainly know that they can detect colour and pattern recognition is possible. But human faces, and knowing that although the faces are different, they're from the same family, 
would there be some olfactory sense that was going on? Could you smell that Mike Brody was the son of uh, Chief Brody? You know, the, the, you know, clearly that's just yeah. fantasy. Sure. It was widely held at that time there could be these rogue sharks. Right. That there were these great whites that liked the taste of human flesh and would stick around an area where there were lots yeah, of... And seek them out. Yeah, yeah. That, that's right. And this rogue idea has sort of stuck around for right. decades, actually. You still hear it, yeah, you, you yeah. still hear it. The Western Australia situation, the mm -hmm. politics there, that, that's all centred around this false concept of rogue sharks. Detailed forecast, as always, at five to six. They're culling a lot of sharks off the coast of Western Australia. After a series of fatal attacks on humans, the state government has ordered the killing of sharks over three metres long near popular beaches. Minister say that Despite new life, tracking technology and years of research, the capture and culls continue. In fictional Amity, local politicians had to be seen to kill the shark to revive tourism. In Western Australia, the local government have permitted the mass killing of large sharks in response to a few fatal attacks on swimmers and surfers. Beaches. Ministers say the cull will save lives. Critics say it's unnecessary and inhumane. Demonstrators have argued that a cull won't make beaches safer and would only harm the sea's delicate ecological balance. These sharks belong to everybody yep. and humans have set themselves up as being custodians of the sea. Well, we're doing a pretty poor job actually. Yeah. And West Australia, I mean, their situation is an example and a poor one. A basic human urge is being tapped into here. Yeah, there right. is fundamental fear of predators hunting us, mm -hmm. and that's multiplied many, many times because it's in the sea. Yeah, yeah. I think there will always be some sort of political recourse mm -hmm. to tapping into that primal fear as a way in which to get traction for your <laughs> argument. Yeah. Of course, it's not a scientific argument. No, no, you right. know, what they're doing has no scientific basis. So I guess the, the, the fictional aspect of Jaws hasn't really gone away. You're right. History is sort of repeating itself, yeah. if Jaws indeed was history. Mm -hmm. So you tag sharks, Baskin sharks, which yeah. are these gentle giants, right? So yeah. they, they don't harm humans in any way. Um, but you often see them off the coast here in Cornwall and Devon. Uh, so do you ever have that sort of sense of excitement that one day you're going to go out, see a fin, mm -hmm. you're going to approach the shark to tag it, and it's a great white? I always hoped for that, actually. I always did hope when I saw a fin that it might be a little more triangular, a little greyer than the, than the basking shark one, but a great white never appeared right. uh, off the UK coast. Do you think there's any chance of a great white coming over the Atlantic? I mean, clearly it's possible they can, they can swim a, you know, great distances in relatively short amounts of time. But in fact, even in summer, the UK coast is a little chilly for some of the larger individuals. But we don't understand their motivations. I mean, clearly in the Jaws movie, the motivation was clear. This thing was hungry, it was a pregnant <laughs> female or whatever. Right. In reality, as someone who studies sharks, their motivations are actually very difficult to determine. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you know them? Hmm, that's really difficult. You can never know an animal, <laughs> right. of course. In fact, for most sharks, we know nothing about their, their natural lives at all. And so they're very much secret lives look it out of the ocean it's mesmerizing it's just such an expanse of of unknowns you know we were just talking to David and there's lots that he doesn't know about things that he's been studying for 20 or more years and just looking out of the ocean there's there's no way from looking at the the surface that you can imagine the diversity and the the, the beauty under the ocean but I guess with that comes a bit of fear in that if we went swimming now who knows what you'd come across I was just wondering what's out there. I think that's that's my draw, that's my pull to the ocean. The beach is a barrier to another world. And another world that we can't really predict. Just recently I've started to be able to paddle, but I prefer to keep my feet on the floor so I can get out. Surely monsters are as much a source of wonder as of fear. <laughs> I think people love the mystique about the sea. Yeah. They love the idea of sea serpents mm -hmm. and sea monsters. Love it. Even when I went over on the cross, cross Channel ferry years ago, you always got the aisles on the sea for something yeah, popping right. his head up. If you look at the old Norwegian um, sagas and legends, you mm -hmm. know, they're full of the, the kraken, right. which is uh, a giant octopus or a giant squid. And there's uh, lots of accounts in uh, ship's logs of this kraken attacking ships. Which in reality is probably a giant squid mistaken mm -hmm. a smaller ship for a whale. Right. Of course, what came out from that account was 
20,000 leagues under the sea. Right, exactly. With a giant octopus. Uh, because, see how oh, these legends do influence the filmmakers. Yeah, and I'm sure Spielberg is not, not, not different. But I, think, I think what, but I think what the film did, what the book definitely did, was really use those myths and legends and use that fear of the unknown in people's minds and really give it a, a reality. Well, what was funny is sit there waiting for the scary bits and mm. you'd have your hand over your face. <laughs> <laughs> The head was only a few feet from the cage when the fish turned and began to pass before Hooper's eyes, casually as if in proud display of its incalculable mass and power. The snout passed first, then the jaw, slack and smiling, armed with row upon row of serrate triangles. And then the black, fathomless eye, seemingly riveted upon him. Don't Go in the Water was presented by Gareth Fraser and produced by Francis Burns. It was a Big Fish radio production for BBC Radio 4. Happy will be beyond the sea And never again I'll go sail Bruce isn't the only villain in Jaws. This was mid-70s post-Watergate America, when this used car salesman was just leaving the White House. People have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Thanks to tricky Dicky Nixon, the American public had somewhat fallen out of love with its politicians. Right. Uh, a summer girl goes swimming. Swims out a little far. She tires. Fishing boat comes along. It's happened before. I don't think you appreciate the gut reaction people have to these things. Harry, I appreciate it. I'm just reacting to what I was told. Right. It's all psychological. You yell barracuda. The racist. Huh? What? You yell shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. Watergate had only just happened. This was the mid-70s where people were intensely cynical, especially in America, about politicians. And it really made you root for Roy Scheider. And you kind of wanted the mayor to get at least a leg nibbled off. He deserved it. Jaws is a quintessential political fable about politicians and risk and how a politician should deal with risk. And I'm basically on the side of the brave politician who doesn't succumb to hysteria and panic. As well as battling a giant fish, Brody had to contend with the political brinkmanship of Amity's grinning but venal mayor, Larry Vaughan, who can't see the danger for the dollar signs in his eyes and insists on keeping the beaches open for the tourist season. Well, we found one man who was willing to stand up and be counted in his support of Mayor Vaughan, MP Boris Johnson. He has the honesty to apply logic to the threat, the alleged threat posed by this shark. Oh, hi, Larry. Why aren't you in the water? Uh, well, uh, I just put some suntan lotion on and uh, I'm trying to absorb well, some of this sun. going in. Please, stand up there. He's told that an extremely dangerous prehistoric fish is eating his constituents. And he knows that this is statistically extremely unlikely on that part of New England that time of the year. You wouldn't get a carcarion carcarias in those waters. That's the Latin name for a great white shark, if you're wondering. It is, you know, a million, a billion to one. He decides, in spite of the hysteria, to keep the beaches open and to allow trade to go on. And I admire that because he shows, uh, you know, true guts in the face of a public panic. I'm pleased and happy to repeat the news that we have, in fact, caught and killed a large predator that supposedly injured some bathers. But as you see, it's a beautiful day, the beaches are open, and people are having a wonderful time. Amity, as you know, means friendship. Uh, of course, you know, as things turn out in the film, his courage is not vindicated by events, and as it happens, there is a large shark eating his constituents and, and so he pays a heavy political price for his bravery. I, I should think it highly unlikely that he was re-elected. <laughs> you were on the Indianapolis? What happened? Japanese submarine slammed two torpedoes into our side, Chief. He was coming back 
From the island of Tinian, the lady just delivered the bum, the Hiroshima bum. Eleven hundred men went into the water. The vessel went down in twelve minutes. Didn't see the first shark for about half an hour. Tiger, thirteen footer. You know, you know that when you're in the water, chief. You tell by looking from the dorsal to the tail. What well, we didn't know was our bomb mission had been so secret. No distress signal had been sent. <laughs> they didn't even list us overdue for a week. Very first light, Chief. Sharks come cruising. So we formed ourselves into tight groups. You know, it's kind of like old squares in a battle, like you see in a calendar, like the Battle of Waterloo, and the idea was, shark comes to the nearest man, that man, he start pounding and hollering and screaming, and sometimes the shark go away. Sometimes he wouldn't go away. Sometimes that shark, he looks right into you, right into your eyes. You know the thing about a shark, he's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eye. When he comes at you, he doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. And those black eyes roll over white and then... Oh, then you hear that terrible high-pitched screaming. The ocean turns red and in spite of all the pounding and the hollering, they all come in and they rip you to pieces. <laughs> You know, by the end of that first dawn, lost a hundred men. I don't know how many sharks, maybe a thousand. I don't know how many men, the average six an hour. On Thursday morning, Chief, I bumped into a friend of mine, Herbie Robinson from Cleveland. Baseball player, Bosun's mate. I thought he was asleep. Reached over to wake him up. Bobbed up and down in the water, it was like a kind of top. Upended. Well, he'd been bitten in half below the waist. Noon the fifth day, Mr. Uber, Lockheed Ventura saw him. She swung in low and he saw us to the young pile of lot. Younger than Mr. Hooper anyway, he saw us and he come in low and three hours later a big fat PBY comes down and start to pick us up. You know, that was the time I was most frightened, waiting for my turn. I'll never put on a life jacket again. So 1,100 men went in the war. 316 men come out, the sharks took the rest, June the 29th, 1945. Anyway, we delivered the bomb.